church, bring your hands together. Sing, here in your light we find. Here in your light we find what makes us come alive, a sacrifice of praise. A city on a hill, surrender to your will, your glory on display. Your glory on display. Awesome in this place. Jesus, you are awesome in this place. Come on. Worthy to be praised. Jesus, you are worthy to be praised. You will be praised. We introduced a new song last week and we're going to continue singing it today. So as you feel confident, sing it out.
because our God is worthy of praise no matter what our circumstances are. No matter if we are in the valley or everything is going well, our God is good, he's sovereign, he's powerful, um, and he's worthy of praise. It says in Jeremiah 32, 17, it says, O sovereign Lord, you made the heavens and earth by your strong hand and powerful arm. Nothing is too hard for you. And that is why we sing, because we are singing to the one true God that can carry whatever burden that we have. The things that you're holding on to, the things that seem unbearable, the things that you're ashamed to let go, you can give those to Jesus because he can handle it. So that's why we sing, amen? So as we sing this next song, let's sing in triumph, knowing that the God that we're singing to is not only worthy of praise, but he is well and capable to deal with whatever it is we're holding on to. So let's use this song as a battle cry, giving it over to Jesus Christ. Sing with us. Come on. Good heart. 
thank you so much for singing with us. You guys can go ahead and have a seat and prepare to hear from Pastor Matt. Hello, sir. Welcome. Wow, that's a lot of baggage. Are you checking in all of that baggage with us today? Yeah. You would like it to fly with you to each and every single destination? Yeah, that's bringing it with me. I'm going to need you to weigh all of that baggage on the scale here, please, for us. There we go. Your baggage is heavy. Oh. Wow, it appears even your baggage has its own baggage. So in our tier system for baggage pricing, yours is marked as excessive, which means that your checked-in baggage comes to a total of $150 in the addition to the $25 travel fee, and the carry-on that you're taking will be an additional $75, not to mention the overages, bringing your grand total to $525.78 with us. How will you be paying? Uh, debit, I guess. Okay. Sure. Is there anything else we can do today to make your experience more accommodating or comfortable for you and or all of your baggage? No, no, <clears throat> no. You just please take my baggage. Good morning, Sandals Church. Hopefully you are awake today. I'm especially awake. Our water heater is broken cold shower in the morning, man, that'll pep you up. So I hope that you're here today awake and ready to do some work, man. I'm going to talk to you today about relational baggage. Man, how many of you ever had some relational baggage with a friend, boyfriend, girlfriend, ex-spouse, mother-in-law, your own parents, right? That's always great, right? We've all had some baggage. And here's the reality. Here's why you need to deal with your baggage, because if you don't deal with your baggage, it's going to deal with with you. About two years ago, my wife just kind of said, hey, I'm done. I want to reimagine our life. I'm not happy with the way some things are going. And she was really, really upset. And I wasn't exactly sure what to do. Um, as far as I could tell, she was okay with me, but she just was really, really upset with some, some issues that were happening in our life. And so, you know, I love her and it was clear, you know, she needed professional help. And so we found a counselor, literally, in the middle of the country, we flew to be with these counselors. There were two of them. We we're going to be there for three days. It costs way more money than you could ever imagine. But, you know, hey, my wife needed it. So we went, right? And so I just made it very, very clear to the counselors, you know, hey, we're here for her. She's had a lot of issues, a lot of wounds in her past. And as a supportive husband, I've joined in the therapeutic process to bless her and to be a spiritual leader. And so day one was great. We focused on her and her issues, but the whole time as we were focusing on her issues, the counselor kept asking me, how do you feel? How do you feel? And guys, I'm a man, right? I have very few feelings. So don't keep asking, that bothers me, or you're gonna learn how I feel. <laughs> but I was bothered by that. Why do they keep asking me how I feel? Day two, same thing, we're still focused on Tammy's past. You know, we're, we're now we're in her high school and her college, which is where her relational baggage with me began. They just kept asking me, how do you feel? How do you feel? Guys, I don't know if you've ever had this, but something's flying in the room and it lands in your eye and it hurts and your eyes begin to well. You're not sure what that is or what flew into your eye. But there was moisture that was collecting in my eye. So we broke for lunch. We've been in counseling literally eight hours the first day, four hours, 12 hours of counseling and something flew in my eye. We went out to lunch, I ordered a salad, didn't eat a piece of lettuce, and I began to weep. And I began to cry as God began to deal with some of my relational baggage. And here's the thing, a lot of you, you, you think, oh man, this is a great message for somebody else. I hope my wife is listening. And every wife is like, please, God, let my husband listen to this message. Right? Some of you don't have baggage. You have a U-Haul. <laughs> and you have brought it to church with you today. Write this in your notes. Here's why we need to deal with our baggage. Because my baggage travels with me. It doesn't matter if you came to church today with a friend or you came by yourself. Your baggage came with you. We're going to look at a very, very important story in John 4 where Jesus deals with relational baggage. It says, so Jesus left Judea and returned to Galilee. 
And for some of you, you have no ge geographical concept of Israel. Israel's a small country. So basically, in a small country, he traveled from the south to the north. He went from the area near or closer to Egypt, and he traveled up to an area closer or near to modern-day Syria. That's, that's how far he walked, a little over 100 miles. But here's an interesting part of the text. I want you to underline these words. And a lot of you read right through this. You've read this story. You've heard this story. But you've never paused here at this point. The author, John, who tells us the story of Jesus, does something unusual. It says he had to go through Samaria on the way. Write in your notes. No, he doesn't. No, he doesn't. He doesn't have to do anything. You know why? He's God. He can do what he wants. Right? He's God. He can do what he wants. He doesn't have to go that way. And, and just let me say, practically, as a human being, he doesn't have to go that way either because there's multiple trails. There's many trails. Most Jews never go through Samaria because there was racial tension. Samaritans were not Jews. They were politically different from Jews. They were ethnically different from Jews. They were hated by the Jews. They hated one another. They couldn't stand one another. You think we have racial problems in America? They had huge problems. Huge problems. Worship the same God but couldn't be further apart in the way they worship God, in the way they live their lives, in the way they saw themselves. Jews don't go to Samaria. But John says Jesus had to. And here's why. Because he has an appointment with someone with some baggage. And I want you to know today that some of you have an appointment with God. And Jesus has to deal with you so you can deal with your baggage. He's going to reroute his time so he can change your life. Think about that. you got to notice the little things in the text. He had to. He's got to go there because somebody has baggage. So eventually, he came to a Samaritan village of Sychar near the field that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus was tired from a long walk. Why? Because not only is Jesus fully God, here's one of the things that Christians have proclaimed for 2,000 years. He's fully man. He is the God man. God understands your life as a human being because he became a human being. He knows what you know. He feels what you feel. When he walks and he doesn't have water, he's tired and he's exhausted. He sat wearily beside the well at about noontime. Some of you guys, you don't believe the Bible. You think it's a made-up story. There's so many things in there that if it's made up, they would omit. Why on earth, if God sent a Savior to the world, would you put that sentence in there? He was tired. Because listen to me, Jesus isn't just a real human being. He's the real Savior of the world. He knows what you know. He feels what you feel. He's tired. He's exhausted. Soon, a Samaritan woman came to draw water. Now, this is unusual. You see, most of us, we never have to go get water. But listen to me. Man, 2,000 years ago, water was essential. This week at our house, we broke our main water supply to our house. It was broken, destroyed. Let me tell you something. We have some missionaries living with us right now from our church. Two adults, four children under the age of 10. Do you know what happens in your house when you don't have water? Toilets don't flush. Kids don't care. They don't care. They'll poop one after another, after another, after another. You have a snow cone of joy in your house. It's terrible. No water all day long. No water, man. You need water. Some of you never even think about it. In the ancient world, without water, you died. It's noontime. It's hot. But here's the thing 2,000 years ago. Culturally speaking, you don't go to get water in the middle of the day. Why is that? Because most of Israel is like Riverside, this close to hell, Amen. This close. Think about what would happen to you if you walked all day long and you ran out of water. Where would you be? This close to death. Jesus is sitting beside the well and he's exhausted. He's tired. So here comes a woman by herself. Ladies, you don't do anything by yourselves. Amen, guys? They do weird things. You go out to dinner. I got to go to the restroom. Does anyone else have to go? They go together. Can you imagine, guys, you're with your bros you're watching the game. Hey, guys, I got to go potty. Does anyone got to go? Who wants to go with me? You're never getting invited to a game again, ever. 
Listen to me, guys. We're dangerous when we're by ourselves. Ladies, you're dangerous when you're together. You become like wolves. It's dangerous. It's scary. It's true. So here she is. She's all by herself. And just write in your notes, this is unusual. This is weird. Not to mention the fact that it might be dangerous culturally as a woman to go somewhere by yourself. It's risky. Why is she taking the risk? Maybe it's because she has some relational baggage. Maybe it's because she has some issues. Maybe it's because not only did she walk by herself, but maybe it's because she couldn't get a friend to go with her. So here's this woman, and Jesus said to her, please give me a drink. He was alone, right? So she's alone. We're not exactly sure why, but it's odd that Jesus is alone. So why is Jesus alone? So John tells us Jesus was alone for the time because his disciples had gone into a village to buy some food, which is just hilarious. Jesus sent the disciples into a Samaritan village to buy kosher Jewish food. That's like being in Ireland going, where's the Mexican food at? <laughs> Brother, you're in the wrong place. The woman was, underline this, surprised. That's taking it lightly. In the ancient world, men do not address women who are not their wife or their daughters. They don't do it. They don't do it. It's just not done. Even, even nowadays, in most of the Middle East, Men do not address women in public. Matter of fact, ladies, do you know this? If you live in the Middle East, most restaurants have a section for men and a section for their wives with their kids. You eat in different places. Tammy and I were in a restaurant in the Middle East a couple years ago, and a woman came with her children to talk to her husband about something that was going on. And he did this. He went. And she just left. So Tammy said something to me, and I just. <laughs> she said, what's wrong with your finger? I don't, I don't know. It's, it's just, it's a different culture. It's a different world. So it's not normal for men and women to talk, even if you're married in public. This is odd. This is bizarre. This is not done. The woman was surprised, for Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans. So there's literally gender issues here. There's cultural issues. There's religious issues. This is not done. And she said to Jesus, you're a Jew. I'm a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? Write in your notes. She got a little attitude with God. Let me just ask you, right? Like if you're going to lose your mind on someone, don't you hope it's not Jesus? Like if someone gets your coffee wrong at Starbucks, don't you hope it's not Jesus? Like if you're irritated with, can you imagine honking your horn on the freeway? Hey, you idiot! And Jesus is like, oh, I'm sorry. Do you need me to park the 91 freeway for you? <laughs> don't you hope it's not Jesus? This is a true story. About a year ago, I was running and I, I don't know how far I'd run. I was getting ready for an Ironman. It was probably 10, 11, 12 miles. It was a long way. So I look a little different when I'm sweaty, tired, and gross. I wear a hat and sunglasses and some spandex occasionally. I don't look like what you see on stage. But as I was running, I ran across one of my employees who goes to our church. And I said, hey, good looking. And his wife stepped in front of him. Excuse me, who do you think you're talking to? And I took my hat off and my glasses off. And I said, I think I'm talking to your husband. She looked at me. She says, well, who are you? I said, your pastor. <laughs> ho, ho, ho. Listen to me. Isn't it sad when relational baggage just comes out? Like some of you today, you decided you were going to be a Christian. You came to church and then somebody took your seat. Oh, you can go to hell. Isn't it funny? Like, oh, I'm going to be a Christian. I just listen to my Christian music, come to church. And I sat next to Satan. <laughs> so here's the thing. No matter where you are, your religious, your, 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 your literally relational baggage goes with you. It's right there under the service. 
Just it's under the surface. It's right there. Isn't it amazing? Married people, raise your hand if you're married. How if just one of you gets the tone wrong, it can set the whole day off. Right? When my wife asks me a question, I got to watch my tone. I got to watch my face. Because your face communicates back. At you. I didn't know this, but it does. Right? She can say, honey, can you take out the trash? And I go, sure. And that's a problem. That's a problem. Right? And so when I do that, she responds. Then I respond. Then we're flying all the way to the middle of the country to pay thousands of dollars to deal with our baggage. Isn't it, isn't it funny how just a little thing can let it out? Little thing? How somebody's tone, somebody's reaction can just tap that wound from when you were a kid? Isn't it funny how somebody can treat us a certain way and all of a sudden we're a little kid? All of a sudden we're young again. Wait a minute, you don't know who I am. And all of a sudden we're the woman at the well yelling at Jesus. Who do you think you are? You're a Jew. I'm a Samaritan. Be gone. She got a little attitude. You know why? Because she's got a lot of baggage. She's got a lot of baggage. Here's the thing. Here's why you're a jerk. You got baggage. Here's why you got marriage problems. You got baggage. Here's why you don't have friends. You got baggage. You got baggage. We got baggage. Have you looked at yourself? You, we have baggage. I got so much baggage, I annoy myself. You ever spent a day by yourself and felt worse? That's me. I don't know who's what happened. It's me. We have baggage. All of us have baggage. And here's the thing, young people, when you fall in love, you pretend, oh, they're just perfect. They got baggage. You got baggage, you got baggage, and it may take a while for you to look at your luggage, but it's there. And it's gonna go with you. And here's what we do in our culture is we drop relationships instead of dropping our baggage. And so we move from relationship to relationship to relationship, and we just drag more and more bags with us, and we don't understand. What, what you needed to change was not your relationship. You needed to change your luggage. Here's the good news, right? So when we're offended and somebody's rude to us, we're like, done. You're done. You're, I'm not even going to pray for you, you know. I wasn't going to tell you about Harvey's Crusade, but now I'm not. can invite you to church. I don't want you at my church. I don't want you in my group. I want you to go to hell. Right? Now, you would never say that out loud because that would force you to deal with your baggage. So you just say things like, well, they're probably not interested in God, clearly. Here's the good news. Write this down. Praise God. Jesus cares more about me than my baggage. Can you imagine if Jesus just walked away because you were a jerk? Because you didn't respond correctly the first time he invited you to be saved. Oh, you think I need to be saved? You, th oh, you, that, you think I'm a sinner? You think I'm the one with problems? Look at your people, God. Can you imagine? Praise God, Jesus cares more about you, more about me than our baggage. Jesus is not like anyone else. All the world sees is our baggage. What Jesus sees is his children. It's lost kids. So Jesus doesn't get offended. He doesn't respond. He doesn't fire back. He doesn't play emotional tennis. Jesus said, if you only know the gift that God has for you and who you are speaking to, you would ask me and I would give you living water. You know what Jesus is saying? Man, you're telling off the wrong person. She says, but sir, you don't have a rope or a bucket, she said, and this well is very deep. She didn't get it. And a lot of us don't get it. 
we don't get what Jesus is offering. She says, you don't have a rope or a bucket. Where would you get this living water? And besides, do you think that you're greater than our ancestor Jacob who gave us this well? How can you offer better water than his sons and his animals? Jesus replied, anyone who drinks this water will soon be thirsty again. And this is most of us. We keep going to the same well over and over and over again. I know what will fix me true love. Well, that didn't work. It wasn't true love. I was young. I was too old. I was too stupid. I'll try again. This is how bad we are at relationships. We've involved computers in the process. What do computers know about relationships? Well, it says we're compatible. Right? What do we know? What do we know about relationships? Everybody always makes fun of arranged marriages everywhere else in the world. They do better at picking than we do. Other parts of the world have a better selection process than we do. Some of you are like, I just don't know why I, I, I can't make a friend. If I just get a friend, I know what I'll do. I'll get on Instagram. That'll make me relational healthier. If I just get a like. Anybody ever had to like your own thing? Because no one liked it. Oh, it's a good post. Oh, now it's awkward because it says, Pastor Matt Brown liked his own comment. I got to read unlike that. And then you call your mom, Mom, you need to like what I posted. <laughs> this is how broken we are as a culture relationally. We don't have real friends, so we have computer friends. Oh, look at this person that I haven't seen in a decade. And I won't see until I die. Like. Like we haven't connected, we haven't talked. We're a relationally broken culture. We keep going back to the same well over and over and over again. Oh, I'm relationally needy. I know it'll help children. That's helpful. Right? I didn't know how broken I was relationally until I had kids. You ever yelled at an infant? What's your problem? <laughs> Do you think this family is about you? Do you know what time it is? But some of us keep going to that well. If I had more friends, I'd be satisfied. If I had more likes, I'd be satisfied. If I was more famous, if more people watched me sing on the internet, I'd be famous. Then I'd be happy. One of my favorite actors from the 90s is Jim Carrey. And not because some people say I look like him, which is not a compliment. <laughs> one of the things I love about him is he's authentic, he's real. He's a mess, but he's real. And here's one of the things that he said lately. He said, my wish for every human being on earth is that they would get everything they always wanted so they could know what I know, that it doesn't work. Do you know that Jim Carrey, in the late 1980s, wrote himself a check for $20 million? Wrote it to himself. And he cashed that check. And he's miserable. He's a mess. He's so messed up, his last girlfriend killed herself. That's his life. He's a mess. Do you know why? He's gone to the well over and over and over again, believing that the next thing will make me happy. The next thing will satisfy me. Oh, if I just make more money, I'll be happier. Oh, if I can just travel there, I'll be happier. Oh, if I just had one friend, if I just had two friends, if I just had three friends. My wife's always asking me, she's all, are you my best friend? I said, don't put that voodoo on me. <laughs> I've seen what women do to each other that they call best friends. I'm going to end up buried in a field. So I'm your husband. And I want to live, right? 
We're messed up, man. We're jacked up, but we keep going to that well over and over and over again. And here's what Jesus is saying. Listen, lady, the reason your life is so messed up is because you keep believing that this well is going to satisfy you. And the reality is you're going to have to come here day after day after day after day, and it will never fulfill you. He said, but those who drink the water I give will never be thirsty again. It becomes a fresh, bubbling spring. Circle this word, within. You see, the world says things without make you happy. Jesus says the problem is within, so what we have to fill is that hole that's inside you. It becomes a fresh, bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. But she doesn't get it. Why? She's relationally broken. Please, sir, the woman said, give me this water. Then I'll never be thirsty again. And I don't have to come to this stupid well in the middle of the day by myself when it's hot. You see, this is what every person wants. Jesus, fix the crap in my life. The problem is the crap is inside you. We think it's outside. Jesus, I want to get a better job. I hate my job. I hate the people that I work with. I hate the people on the 91 freeway. I hate this world. Fix them Jesus says, I want to fix you. Here's what Jesus offers. He doesn't offer to make the world better. He offers to make you better. What's going to change is not your circumstances. What's going to change is how you see them. And here's why Christians are miserable. I want all my problems to go away. I don't want anything to go wrong. Jesus said, I've come to offer you eternal life. A life-giving spring that flows inside you even when there's a drought. Write this down. Jesus wants to help me with my baggage. So just so you know, it's culturally inappropriate at the time for Jesus to have an ongoing conversation with a woman by himself. Shouldn't happen, shouldn't be done. So Jesus is saying, hey, if we're gonna get real, if we're gonna talk about this life-giving spring that I'm offering, in order for us to be okay, I need you to go get your husband so we can continue this conversation, so we don't raise any eyebrows. He says, go and get your husband so we can continue this talk. She says, underline it, I don't have a husband. I don't, I, don't, I don't have one. We can keep on talking. We can keep on talking, Jesus, about this spring, about this eternal life, about this water, about how I don't have to come to this well anymore. I don't have a husband, Jesus. You can talk directly to me. You can get real with me, Jesus. Just tell me. And Jesus says, go get your husband. I, I don't have a husband. And Jesus said, underline this. You're right. You don't have a husband, for you've had five husbands. And you aren't even married to the man you're living with now. And some of you are like, that's rude. No, it's real. Jesus is not trying to insult her. He's trying to save her. Because you know what her false well is? It's men. It's men. Listen to me. Some of you who are single, you're just so certain that if you're married, your well would be full. It's not true. There are many married people who are empty. Jesus says, go and get your husband. I don't have a husband. You're right, you've had five. Now listen to me, if you've been married five times today, wow. Being married five times 2,000 years ago was unheard of. She's culturally untouchable. The guy she's with now will sleep with her, but he won't marry her. That's where she is. That's why she doesn't have any girlfriends. No woman wants to be seen with her because they don't want to be confused as being like her. She's untouchable, she's baggage. She's worthless, she's useless in that culture. 
Who on earth would love her? Who on earth would give her another chance? Here's the good news. Jesus. He's willing to commit. He said, I do on the cross forever. Jesus wants to help me with my baggage. Listen to me, ladies. We live in a culture that doesn't produce men. It just doesn't. A lot of men are growing old, but they're not growing up. That's our culture. Listen to me, ladies. You don't need a man. You need Jesus. A couple of years ago, when Sandals still let me do counseling... I don't think I was as bad as everybody remembers. I was doing counseling with a woman whose husband had left her. And to make matters worse, he called himself a Christian. Doesn't that always add to the baggage? Oh, but he said he loved God. He had a Christian t-shirt. He had a tattoo. And this is what she asked me. She said, why do men always leave? I said, I haven't left you. She said, you're not a man. <laughs> Do you know how many times I've had women tell me that? My, you're not a man, you're a pastor. You don't count. You look like Jim Carrey. <laughs> Some of you have been left by your mom. Many of you have been left by your dad. And it's messed you up. It's messed you up. You've left, been left by a husband, a wife. Some of you have been left and abandoned. The very kids you raised, the very kids you sacrificed for, the very kids you got up in the middle of the night with, they left you. And you're like, why does everybody leave? And Jesus says this, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Even if heaven and earth pass away, he says, I will be with you. We worship Emmanuel, which means the God who is with us. That's who he is. That's who he is. And so many of you guys, so many of you guys, you just, if I just, if I just finally fall in love, if I find real love, right, every stupid magazine as you're going through the grocery store says, true love, how to find true love. Listen to me, if human beings know how to do that, there wouldn't be any more magazines. Listen to me, you want to find true love? You don't need someone to get on their knees for you. You need to get on your knees for Jesus. That's what you need. That's what you, that's all you need. That's all you need. Listen, I'm an old fashioned guy. I just am. I, I, I've been born in the wrong time. I wouldn't let my girls date until they were 18. Everybody thought I was, what are you, a communist? Maybe. <laughs> and I told my girls, I know you're ready to date. I said, I'm not. It's not you, it's me. I don't want to kill someone and go to jail. So to keep your dad out of prison, let's not date. So my girls, I said, once you turn 18, then we can, we can start talking about dating. And I've watched them start dating and all oh, my heart breaks. My heart breaks. Listen to me, girls. I, I, ladies, I'm not a perfect dad, but I love my girls. And here's what I want for them. Here's my, my heart cry. I said, find a guy that loves you the way I do. Listen, this is what God wants for you. He wants you to find love the way he loves you. And he says, I'm not leaving. I'm not leaving. Even if you deny me, this is what God says. Even if you are faithless, I will be faithful. Because that's who I am. Listen to me. Jesus wants me to deal with my baggage, but here's how we have to do it. Here's the thing. Here's, what all, here's why all of us can't let go of our bags, because we ask the wrong questions. Here's how you know you're not ready to let go of your bags, because you ask a question that is about God and not you. And here's the question we ask. Here's what keeps you from releasing your baggage. You ask why. 
Why, God, did this happen? Why did my dad leave? Why did my mom leave? Why did my husband do this? Why did my wife do that? And we ask questions that puts everything on God and nothing on us. And as long as you do that, you will carry around bags. Some of you, a U-Haul for the rest of your life. Don't ask why, ask what. What? What? My husband left me. Don't ask why, ask what? My wife left me. Don't ask why, ask what? Ask what does Jesus see in me? Here's a woman who's been left five times. Here's a woman with, that's with a man who won't make it right. What on earth does Jesus see in her that everyone else has missed? John 4, 27. Then the disciples came back. Tweedledum and Tweedledee times 12. <laughs> Underline it. They're shocked. Oh, to find him talking to a woman. This woman. Why, Jesus, would you do that? The elections are in November. <laughs> TMZ is around the corner. Somebody's tweeting this conversation as we speak. This is going to look bad, Jesus. It's going to look bad. Why would you talk to her? I love the next line, but no one had the nerve to ask. What do you want with her? Why? Why her? They see trash. Jesus sees treasure. 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 You matter more than you know. You mean more to God than you know. Don't ask why. Ask, what does Jesus see in me? Next, ask this. What does Jesus want me to learn? If you've been married five times, your picker's broke. I know some of you went to the Ed Sheeran concert last night. One of his lines that just confuses me is he says... The club is no place to find love, so the bar is where I go. <laughs> this is a love poet from our culture. This Ed Sheeran is our Socrates, our Plato, right? He's our Shakespeare. The club is no place to find love, so the bar is where I go. Don't go to the bar to find love. There's just no good man in the world. No, your picker's broke. You got a bad picker. What does Jesus want me to learn? Listen to what he says. Jesus replied, believe me, dear woman, the time is coming when it will no longer matter whether you worship the Father on this mountain or in Jerusalem. Underline this. You Samaritans know very little about the one you worship. Write this in your notes. The less I know about God, the more baggage I have. Here's where you're missing it, God, Jesus says. You don't know God. He said, we Jews know all about him. For salvation comes to the Jews, but the time is coming, and it is de indeed now here when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, and the Father is looking for those who will worship him that way. God's always been looking for people who are ready to get real. And the woman said, I know the Messiah is coming, the one who is called the Christ. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. And here's the thing you need to know about Jesus. When you read through the Gospels, he always tells the disciples, don't tell anybody what I did. Don't tell anybody who I am. Let's keep it on the down low. But here, when he meets a woman who is broken beyond human ability to fix, Listen to what he says. I am the Messiah. There are four times in the Bible, in the Christian Bible, there's only four. Only four times in the Christian Bible do you see these words. God is. 
God is light. God is love. God is consuming fire. The fourth time is right here in this passage. Listen to me, ladies. Jesus says, God is spirit. Why would he tell that to a woman who spent her whole life pursuing men? God is not a man. Stop worshiping them. You missed it. You missed it. Here's what Jesus is saying. When I lose a friend, when I lose a marriage, when my relationship with my mom and my dad is broken, when I don't feel like I have any friends, when I feel all alone, what does God want me to learn? All I need is Jesus. That's what he wants me to learn. I don't need more friends. I don't need more family. I need more Jesus. He says everything you're hoping for, everything you want is standing right in front of you. Next question, what is Jesus calling me to do? Don't ask, why did this happen? Ask, what is he calling me to do? You see, why is in the past, what is in the future? The woman left her water jar beside the well and ran back to the village, the very village that had abandoned her, the very village that had rejected her, the very village that would not produce one woman to go to the well with her. The village that hurt her, the village that shamed her, the village that abused her. She ran right back. Listen to what she said. She said, come and see the man who told me everything I ever did. Apparently the conversation was longer than what we have recorded. Could he possibly be? And it says Messiah, but here's what she means. Could he be the one we've all been waiting for? So the people came streaming to the village to see him. Do you know why people will come to church with you? They'll come when you share what Jesus has done for you in this place. They will. Oh my gosh, you were an idiot. You have changed. Well, I'm going to go. I'm going to go. Think about that. Come to the place where I got real and Jesus pulled back the mask but said, I still love you. What is Jesus calling me to do? Number one, release my past. Release my past. Can I just be honest with you? I don't know why. I don't know why you were hurt. I don't know why you were raised in a cult. I don't know why your dad left you. I know this, your father in heaven will never leave you. I don't, know, I don't know why people do the things that they do. But I know what God wants to do in your life, and he wants to help you release your past. Next. He wants me to reimagine my future. He wants me to reimagine my future. Last night in church, I ran into a young lady in our church who's had a lot of trauma, a lot of death. Young lady, early 20s. And she said, Pastor Matt, I got a problem. I said, what? She said, I'm moving to Nashville. I said, why is that a problem? She said, I love my church. I said, why are you going to Nashville? She said, because it's my dream to be a singer. I said, why don't you sing on stage? Oh, I quit worshiping God when my friend killed himself. I said, did you hear the pastor? He said, let go of your past and reimagine your future. Oh, yeah, don't talk to me in the lobby. I know, that hurt. let it go, let it go. God gave you a voice, use it for him. Use it for him. You don't need to go to Nashville to use it for him. You can use it for him right here, right now. Reimagine your future. Yep, past sucked, it did, it did. Your future doesn't have to if you give Jesus your past. Jesus said this, come to me. Oh, I went to church. Uh, Jesus didn't say go to church, he said come to me. Oh, I went to church and, and people who claimed to know God, they hurt me. You know what Jesus says, me too, me too. Do you know who killed God, killed Jesus? People that claimed to worship God. 
That's who killed him. That's who murdered him. You've been hurt by Christians? Jesus says, me too. Me too. He says, come to me. All of you who are weary and you carry heavy burdens, you got a lot of baggage. You got a lot of bags. You got a lot of hurt. He says, and I will give you rest. Do you know why you're tired? Do you know why you're exhausted? Do you know why you're wiped out? Because you're carrying things you can't carry. He says, take my yoke upon you. Jesus has a carry on. A little piece of luggage. It's not a lot in it. Just a little piece of paper says, love God, love others. You can carry that. You can do that. He says, take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart. And you will find rest for your souls. I know some of you have been hurt with things I cannot imagine. But Jesus can and he loves you. In my last small group, not the current one I'm in, there was a woman who's about my age. And this is hard, but I'm going to share it. Her abuser was her dad. The guy who was supposed to protect her and love her and shield her from darkness is the one who brought darkness into her life, into her home. She comes to church where we say God's a good father and that just wrecks her. Why? Because she's stuck on why. Why? And over time, I saw God begin to work a miracle in her life. And I'll never forget, she had a child of her own, terrified to bring a child into this hurtful, painful world. But I will never forget the first time she introduced me to her son. She got on her knees with her son and she says, this is our pastor. I'll never forget the words. And she said, and he is safe. He is safe. Oh, it wrecked me. Do you know why I'm safe? Because I've come to the one who invented safety. I brought him my baggage and he began to heal me. Listen to me, some of you are terrified. Jesus says, come on. I know it's dark. I know it's ugly. I know it's evil. But come to me. Listen to me, some of you, the only way to reveal baggage is, release your baggage is in counseling. For some of you, it's in a community group where you sit with men who are safe. For some of you, you can release your bags today at the end of service. You come forward and you go, here it is. Here it is. And you let it go. I don't know how God's going to work the miracle in your life, but he's not going to work it until you meet him at the well. There's a reason Jesus had to go to Samaria because he had to deal with some baggage. Let him deal with yours today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, in the name of God, we pray for your fiercest angels, your most powerful angels to surround this place. Lord, block darkness from this place. Block evil from this place. Fight for us right now. In Jesus' name, we pray. Get us alone with you. Help us to feel safe. Help us to trust you. And God, if you're calling us to meet you at the well, God, I pray that we would do that right now, right here in this place. We're all broken. We're all hurting, but some of us need to deal with our brokenness right here in the name of Jesus. We pray this in your name. Amen. I love you, Sandals Church. God bless. Thank you, Pastor Matt. Man, would you guys hang tight as we just move into a time of reflection and we're heading towards a time of prayer at the end of our service. And before we do that, we have a time of giving. It's been so great to see here at our Hunter Park campus as uh, we get back into the fall, everyone's getting into their rhythms, school's coming, school's started. And uh, we've just been more and more full here. Listen, if you were in and out over the summer, I would love to invite you as we have this time of giving right now. You can use this as a time to catch up on some of your giving if you were traveling or missed uh, some of those opportunities. 
We've got our Sandals Church app. It's absolutely easiest way for you to give. And uh, I'm, I'm really excited as we move closer to our 40 Days of Faith series. Our tech team is working really hard on some cool, cool improvements to the app, uh, whether you're on Android or Apple phone, to get us closer to a really awesome experience during that series. So thank you for your giving. And then just hang tight. Let's hang tight for this last song. Let's have a, a time of really reflecting on what it is that we have an opportunity or maybe God is calling us to let go of today, and then we'll close our time together with prayer. Would you stand as we sing this last song? Sing this with me. Peace, bring it all to peace. The storm surrounding me, let it break.
sing this with me. There's a name we can call on. Lift your voices. Proven steady and true. Unrivaling power. It's faithful to see you through. There's a name we can call on. Most worthy of trust, higher than any other, the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. As we move into a time of prayer, man, this moment could be the most important moment in some of your lives right now. It wasn't the time of giving or the time of singing or even necessarily Pastor Matt's message, but the decision that you make right now to just turn around and walk out these doors carrying whatever you came in with, or maybe to come forward and to pray with one of our ministers, one of our prayer team members here at Sandals Church could be the most important decision of your life. I'm not saying it is, but for some of you, it could be. We would love to invite you forward for prayer. Maybe you need to let go of some baggage. Maybe you need to let go of some relational pain, some relational hurt. Maybe you just need to come forward and pray with somebody for the courage to make an important phone call. Maybe to reach out to a counselor. I, I don't know what it is for your life. Maybe you, you're actually thinking this whole Jesus thing sounds so much different than what I thought it was gonna be and you're willing to give our life with Jesus a shot. We would love to pray with you about that. Whatever you have going on in your life, we would love to pray with you. And I also love Pastor Matt's challenge. Some of us just need to be in a healthy group with other people here at Sandals Church. So on your way out of here, I just really wanna encourage you, if you're not already in a small group, the absolute best thing you can do is to just start one. We've made it so easy. On your way out of here, there's an information desk where you can grab a box and we would love to see you grab some friends, a couple family members and start a group when we launch the 40 Days of Faith series in just two more weekends. We love you guys. I hope you have a great week. Blessings on you this week. Peace. <laughs>